Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. We're about ready to get started, so if you could wind your conversations down and find your seats, I would appreciate it. Welcome. My name is Colin Jones, and as president of City Club, I have the pleasure of telling you a little bit more about our organization before we get started. City Club was founded in 1916 by a group of young leaders who felt the city was not responding to the needs of everyday people. More than a century later, we're building on that legacy by bringing together a diverse community of thinkers and doers to spark change across our region. century, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. 
We're gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel and are joined by thousands of people via X-Ray FM and its radio stations at 107.1 and 91.1 FM, KGW's website, Facebook feed and news app, and Open Signal's community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for all the work they do to bring Friday Forum to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our sponsors, volunteers, and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank AARP Oregon, Avangrid Renewables, and SEIU 49 for their generous support of this and all our Friday forums this fall. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. Today, we have a special Friday Forum for you. There is no moderator. Instead, you'll have an opportunity to hear a conversation between two colleagues in the US House of Representatives as they discuss how Democrats will address the rising challenges we face as a nation. First, we have the Congressman from the East Side, Earl Blumenauer. In one way, at least, Earl's career uh, is, epitomizes politics in America today because one of his very best ideas was distorted and demonized. Earl years ago had this sensible idea with bipartisan support that Medicare should pay doctors for having conversations with patients about end-of-life decisions. Bipartisan support, but there's also Sarah Palin who said, oh, that's death panels. Fortunately, ultimately, Earl prevailed and Medicare does now reimburse doctors for the time they spend discussing end-of-life decisions. A very good thing. <laughs> Now, we here, of course, have always known Earl Blumenauer as a transportation walk, an advocate for bike lanes and for streetcars. But nationally, recently, he's become known for something completely different. It was Peter Tosh who said, legalize it and I will advertise it. And then Peter Tosh died and a lot of us thought, what's the point anymore? Fortunately, in the past few years, Earl Blumenauer has stepped up to fill the void left by Peter Tosh going to every corner of America to proclaim that everybody must get stoned. <clears throat> and then we have our congressman from the east side, former state legislator, from the west side, former state legislator, Suzanne Bonamici. When I look at Suzanne's committee assignments, it occurs to me that if she were in the majority, she'd be ideally suited to restrain this administration from some of its worst impulses. But being in the minority, those assignments must be uniquely frustrating. Suzanne is a consumer advocate. She once worked as a lawyer for the FTC, and she's on the Education Committee, dealing with an administration that thinks the primary job of the Department of Education is to make it easier for private for-profit colleges to rip off students. She's also on the Science Committee, dealing with an administration that thinks that science is a Chinese hoax. Nevertheless, she has persisted, and she's had some victories, like getting bipartisan support for a bill to improve our tsunami warning systems, which is very important to the state, and especially Suzanne's district, which includes the North Coast. As Lou Reed once sang about her, <clears throat> she does what she's gotta do, she does everything she can, she does what she's gotta do, and we love you, Suzanne. Ladies and gentlemen, Earl Bloom and Aaron Suzanne Bonamici. Greatest introduction. Thank you, Steve. Hi, Earl. Howdy. What you up to? Oh, we might have a conversation today. I'm looking forward to it. A few things on people's minds. Indeed. And I would like to start by expressing my appreciation to you in the City Club for abandoning the very comfortable chair casual conversation because I'm still recovering from a broken back and I don't think I could sit for an hour, particularly without fidgeting and you would misinterpret. So I appreciate <laughs> your, your courtesy uh, no problem. Allowing this uh, sort of stand-up uh, forum for a stand-up gal. Uh, I guess we just plunge in. Let's do it. 
Well, first, um, as you know, uh, the current occupant of the White House uh, has been leading efforts to gut our efforts at climate change, uh, carbon pollution, uh, even as they're spending significant sums of money on nuclear weapons that we can't afford and we can't afford to use, right. while his Defense Department acknowledges that climate change is a threat to national security. Do you think, if our team takes over, there'll be an opportunity to maybe divert some of those resources from the military to deal with reducing carbon pollution, energy efficiency, and moving forward? That's a great question, Earl, and again, thanks to the City Club. Um, we have some questions that we're going to be talking about, including this important one, and we're going to leave a lot of time for your questions. Um, I really appreciate that question, Earl, because it gives us an opportunity to talk about how budgets are statements of priorities, uh, and fortunately, the the separation of powers uh, shows that it's Congress's role to write the budget, and we've been able to block some of the really bad things that this administration has been doing. But in terms of getting good things done, uh, Earl said, if our team takes over, I'm going to be optimistic and say when. Um, but, but we know, so, so you really identified two issues, the, the very large defense budget and the inability to really take needed action to address climate change, which, as you noted, the military, the Department of Defense, understands is a threat. Um, I served on the Budget Committee uh, my first year uh, in the House. It was a great opportunity to be in the middle of the process and to see how the the priorities are made, um, and I know, because one of my first hearings, and Earl was on that committee at the time as well, one of my first hearings was with the then um, defense uh, head, uh, Leon Panetta, uh, from the de Defense Department at the time, of course it was the Obama administration, he said what we really need to keep our country safe is smart investments in cybersecurity and intelligence, and we know that we can make those investments and keep our country safe, but if we don't do anything about climate change, uh, we're in serious trouble, and we know that. We, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just put out another alarming report. Here in Oregon, you know, we are, we are doing some great work that we can replicate and talk about back in D.C., but the defense budget is enormous, right? And we have to have oversight, and that's something that we also haven't had, have oversight of where these dollars are going. Because right now, we'd be much better off as a country investing in re renewable technologies and research and making sure that we are uh, educating a workforce to work in those areas so that we can get to 100% renewable energy. You know where we're spending our dollars? We're sending troops to the border. We're sending troops to the border because there are women and children fleeing poverty who are heading toward the southern border. That's not a good use of our resources. We need to step up. Um, there are several things that are um, going to be part of the conversation. Uh, there's an, already a Healthy Climate and Family Security Act that's been introduced. It's a cap and dividend bill. I'm sure we'll be having conversations about that. Uh, I mentioned funding, uh, the, the research we need both at the National Science Foundation and making sure that we have those good investments in renewable technology, battery storage, all of those, all of those topics will be conversations. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, serving on a climate uh, a committee where, a science committee where climate change is real <laughs> and, and not viewed as a hoax, uh, which has unfortunately been a lot of the conversation uh, in, in this Congress and, and, and in the last couple of years. So um, I'm optimistic that we'll have these conversations and that we will be able to get bipartisan support for a lot of these ideas, especially if we focus on uh, national security as well as the other important issues like um, ocean acidification, things I've been working on. And I know you'll be right there too in that conversation, Earl. All right. I'm going to move on to another topic, housing. It's something that we hear about no matter where we are, in, in not just in Portland, but across Northwest Oregon and Oregon. <clears throat> Affordability is a, a, a major issue uh, in, in other West Coast cities as well. 
Um, there's a bill that's been introduced in the Senate, Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, would increase federal investment in affordable housing, uh, pay, paying for it by raising the estate tax. It would create a grant program. There's an interesting idea here, create a grant program to local governments if they're willing to change zoning laws uh, to make it easier to develop more housing. Uh, the grants could be used for things like new schools, parks, transit. Uh, do you think something like this might pass the House and is representatives of an area known for both smart land use policies and a housing crisis? Uh, what, do you, what are you going to do? What can we do to address these issues? Well, uh, Senator Warren has focused on two things that are essential. Number one is that part of the housing crisis we have now is a misallocation of federal resources. We have been systematically cutting back support for the poorest Americans. Uh, that's not a prescription for success. Uh, even while we uh, watch that there are a whole range of federal policies that subsidize housing developers that emerged in their tax scam legislation right. uh, that provided more benefits for the richest Americans to be able to exploit their opportunities to invest in housing while they made it harder for normal Americans to say nothing of poor people. And all of you are going to get a nice surprise, those of you who are homeowners. Uh, one of the provisions in their tax scam is to make a severe limitation on the amount of deduction you have for your state uh, income tax and local property taxes. Uh, kind of surgically designed to punish blue states, but to punish states where citizens have stepped up to tax themselves to deal with some of these gaps in federal policy. We absolutely should uh, uh, reverse uh, their flawed and cynical policies uh, dealing with the inheritance tax. There's no reason in God's green earth that we should increase further the deficit by giving, again, benefits for the most privileged when we're not helping people who are really caught in the crossfire of the housing crisis. The notion of including as part of federal policy some grants and incentives for state and local governments that are going to try and increase supply. And part of our challenge is that, at times, our policies work against ourselves. Now, I believe in neighborhood integrity as much as the next person. I believe in citizen participation. I love what we've done in Oregon with engaging the land use, but we find that in many areas, there's severe resistance to increasing the number of units that are available. You know, we're fond of uh, being in the crossfire, fond, fond of saying uh, people are only opposed to two things, sprawl and increased density. <laughs> we have opportunities to creatively, sensitively increase housing opportunities in a city like Portland, mm -hmm. um, doing it in concert with our principles and, and traditions. But adding to housing supply. If we don't add to housing supply, we're doomed uh, to increase the pressure on price. And candidly, sprawl is not the answer. Because what we have seen, the reason that we have increased density in the city of Portland, more housing than throughout the region, is because that's where people want to live. You're not going to bribe them to be out in the hinterlands, particularly young people who don't want to be tethered to a single occupant vehicle, and geezer baby boomers like me <laughs> that would like to be in a rich, vibrant, diverse neighborhood. That's the market. That's where people are going to go. Having federal incentives to help people do the right thing, and for heaven's sakes, investing more <clears throat> in providing housing assistance for those who are most in need is absolutely essential. I just want to. I want to add to. Yes, I just want to add what a what a lost opportunity when Earl mentioned the the tax bill tax scam that passed. It was very partisan. It was going moving very quickly. N really, no opportunity for input. We could have done so much more with 
earned income tax credits and low income housing tax credits and community development block grants and all of these policies that would help, not with housing, just housing, but also lifting people out of poverty. Really lost opportunity. I hope we can fix that when we go back. Earl. Ma'am, if Democrats or when Democrats, I don't want to jinx it. I mean, I like the way it's going, but I remember 2016. But if Democrats are successful, as most of the projections are now, mm -hmm. it will be because of women voters and women candidates. I've had the opportunity to be involved with over 100 races around the country. And we've got some pretty terrific men who are running for office. But the women are off There's the charts. <laughs> off the charts. <clears throat> Suzanne, what do you think Democrats need to do if this scenario plays out to prove themselves worthy of the support of women voters and to keep faith with our women candidates? Wow, that's a great question. And as the only woman in the delegation, I'm happy to have to respond. Um, I, I certainly think uh, no matter who we are, anyone who is in elected office needs to prove themselves worthy. Uh, but, I, but I do want to mention, uh, because uh, we're still less than 20% women in, in Congress, what a difference it makes to have women in office and around the table. And we have seen, uh, especially since the 2016 ele uh, election, women marching and organizing and getting involved and speaking up and running for office in truly record numbers. And the, the, Earl mentioned these candidates. I mean, they're, it's not just because they're women. They're amazingly qualified smart, involved, um, dedicated women with values and hard work and not one but two women who served in the CIA and doctors and a water rights lawyer and the woman who ran the auto recovery program in Detroit and the list just goes on and on and on. And they're stepping up and running because they know it's going to make a difference. We already have a pretty diverse caucus, the House Democratic Caucus in terms of you know, people of color, LGBTQ, but it's going to be even more so, uh, assuming that everything goes the way the projections are. And, and where it really makes a difference, there's a lot of issues that women put at the top. Uh, they make priorities that, that oftentimes, I mean, we have great male colleagues, you know, many, many of them in our, our delegation and many in our, our caucus. But issues like paid family leave, like affordable childcare, like equal pay for equal work. I mean, those are issues that women, access to reproductive health care. Those are issues that women put at the top and make sure that they are on the list uh, to, to be uh, part of our, our agenda and our policy. So I'm thrilled that there are so many uh, women running and look like they're going to win. And it also serves as a model for uh, young women. I serve on the education committee and I really like going to schools. I have 25 school districts in the uh, congressional district I'm honored to represent. And for girls to be able to look up and see that women are leaders as well, that's really going to make a difference in the long term. So thanks for the question, Earl. All right, Earl. Something you know about. So infrastructure. Now, the, the president promised to invest in infrastructure, right? We, I know we've, we've had a couple of infrastructure weeks, but we haven't really seen an infrastructure bill, uh, a, a package. We had the massive tax cut. So, Will the House, um, what are we going to do about the tax cut? Are we going to roll that back and then use the funding uh, to pay for infrastructure? Or how do you think deficit reduction is going to happen? And what are we going to do about infrastructure, which we know we desperately need? And Earl has all the answers. Oh, well, <laughs> what a surprise question. Um, let me think. Well, first of all, let me say that I am excited that our friend and colleague, Peter DeFazio, is in line to chair the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Okay. Peter, in his shy, retiring way, <laughs> has been an outspoken champion, and he's been a tremendous partner for us in the metropolitan area. He, he 
streetcar, bikes, light rail, Peter has been somebody who understands and has been here with us. He will provide energy, vision, and focus to that committee. But my goal uh, as a Ways and Means Commander, I left the committee that I loved a dozen years ago uh, to go to Ways and Means specifically to work on infrastructure finance. Everybody says they support it, but when it comes time to pay the bill, they start mumbling or running away. And we can't do that. First of all, it's important to me that we move forward in a way that does not add to the deficit. We've been knocking over tin cans now, looking behind seat cushions, borrowing from the Chinese for inadequate infrastructure investment. That needs to stop. And the way we do it, and it's something I've been working uh, with uh, the Democratic leadership, with Richie Neal, who's in line to be chair of my Ways and Means Committee, with Peter, is to develop a subcommittee on Ways and Means that is dedicated to infrastructure finance. Since the Republicans have been in charge, this is four days shy of eight years, they have had 404 committee hearings for Ways and Means. And in that almost eight years, they found time for one witness to speak for five minutes before they went back to repeal Obamacare again. Our proposal is to dedicate that subcommittee to listening to what Americans want to do. Now, I caused a little ripple when I introduced the first legislation in 24 years to raise the gas tax. But you know, recently, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has proposed a 25 cent a gallon gas tax increase. And they couldn't find time to hear them. Or the truckers who pay almost half the bill, no time to listen to them. In that time, 33 states have put together bipartisan proposals to successfully raise infrastructure funding. If we're in charge, I'm committed to our listening to the American public about what they want, what they need, what they're willing to do, and then work with them cooperatively to meet those needs, to give Peter a trillion or a trillion and a half dollars without increasing the deficit. And if 33 states can do that, I'm convinced under democratic leadership, we can do that in the House of Representatives. Yay! <laughs> Look forward to you chairing that subcommittee, Earl. Now, I did mention our colleagues seem to be obsessed with repealing Obamacare. Uh, something like 75 votes in the eight years. That's their, that's their mantra. That was their agenda for the eight years they've been in charge. They appear to be somewhat defensive about that now. They do, indeed. I think they found out that their constituents might not like Obamacare, but they really like the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. <laughs> If only we would have thought of that. <laughs> Notwithstanding, Suzanne, do you think there are, you do a lot of work trying to reach across the aisle? Absolutely. And often with success, do you think health care will offer an opportunity in a new Congress, if Democrats are controlling, to be able to reach across the aisle, even in a time of Trump, to be able to make some progress? Uh, absolutely. And you look back at some of the things the president promised, we could just aim toward those. <laughs> Better affordable health care for all and lower prescription drug costs. This is an issue that comes up everywhere. I've had people stand up at town hall meetings in tears because they're terrified. I had a 20, young, young 20, woman in her young 20s stand up at a town hall meeting and say, um, I, I'm really excited because I'm, I'm going to be an architect and I'm in my schooling, and I'm, but I was just diagnosed with MS, and I don't know what I'm going to do. 
if I can't have access to health care. I had the head of the Oregon Association of Pediatrics stand up and say, do people really understand how many children get their health care through Medicaid and Medicaid expansion? So people are, are rightly concerned about what's happened, especially people with pre-existing conditions. So you know, there's a little debate going on right now about who really supports um, protections for people with pre-existing conditions, but I know we're absolutely committed to that in the short term. and course, stabilizing the markets. Um, Kurt Schrader, our colleague who serves on energy and commerce where they deal with um, health care issues, is working on that with bipartisan support. So there's some short-term things that we can do, uh, but, but in the long term, and, and addressing prescription drug costs, which uh, I know our, our caucus is, is very much uh, uh, looking forward to working on, even starting with letting Medicare negotiate for prescription drug costs like the VA does. I mean, simple things like that that will help. But in the long term, we all know our healthcare system is too complicated and too expensive and there are too many people who still don't have access. So we, can, we need to look at some structural changes. I know there's di several different pieces of legislation pending. There's some that allow people to buy into Medicare. And there's, of course, Medicare for all. And I know we'll be having conversations about how much support we can get and looking at studies that show uh, how much we pay in this country compared with other countries that have something that's closer to a single payer system. I know we'll be having those conversations, so short term and long term. Great answer, although I am surprised you didn't leap to the obvious conclusion, medical marijuana. <laughs> And bipartisan support. But. So we're, we're almost at the end of our 20 minutes. So we have a couple more we're going to do quickly. Okay, so Mitch McConnell has made it pretty clear. And now we're going to, we're going to have, I, oh, yes, we're going, to, we're going to get cannabis off the schedule. Right, <laughs> I know. Earl wants me to say that. Um, so we have two more, uh, and then we're going to get into our discussion with you. Mitch McConnell's made it clear that Republicans want to cut Medicare, Social Security. Um, might you propose raising money to preserve Social Security by ending the tax exemption or raising or, or lifting the, the cap on Social Security? Well, the short answer to this, absolutely there's an opportunity for us to refocus attention on that fundamental safety net. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are foundational. And we're going to hold Trump accountable for the statements he made during the election that he'd protect it. Raising the cap on Medicare, uh, uh, excuse me, on Social Security earnings is an obvious one. We're facing, in 14 years, about a 25% cut in Social Security. Unacceptable. If anything, we should be looking at increasing benefits because this increasingly is foundational for Americans, as we see with the assault on organized labor, uh, the benefits in terms of pension plans. Uh, Social Security is going to be even more important in the future. Raise the cap, enrich the programs, fight to the death to protect social, of, of Medicare and Medicaid. Right. Earned benefits. Now, immigration appears to be in the news. Uh, every time this guy loses some traction, he gins up, uh, I mean, the, 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 the threat now to send troops to the border because there's a ragtag group of a few thousand desperately poor people slowly walking towards our border. Uh, I think the rate they're going now, it'll probably be the 4th of July, uh, but that's too late. Um, Suzanne, in terms of the hateful rhetoric we see, in terms of how it is being woven in to campaigns across the country, um, and the continued failure of Congress to be able to enact comprehensive immigration reform, do you think we have an opportunity to do something if we're in the majority? Yes, absolutely. The immigration system is broken, and we see that and we hear that on a daily basis from people we talk to, whether they be uh, dreamers who are here in this country contributing, whether they be families that are torn apart. When we just helped, my office staff is here, Yateen Bonamici, we just helped a 12-year-old girl um, here in, in Oregon who's diagnosed with terminal cancer, one parent in Oregon, one parent in Mexico, and her visa was denied, so she couldn't see her 
say goodbye to her other parent. So we helped get her to her parent. But day after day, there, there are cases like that where families are separated, and of course it's horrific intentional separation of families at the border. That's not who we are as a country. It is so wrong. It absolutely has to stop. So again, there are short-term and long-term things we can do. We, we have to pass the DREAM Act. <laughs> and we were really close to doing that, really close. We have to do that. That's one piece, but we desperately need comprehensive immigration reform. There was a bipartisan bill that passed the Senate in 2013. House was never allowed to vote on it. Um, you know, they're just story after story. We, we don't need these troops down at the border. As, you know, it's, it's absurd. Um, looking forward to the oversight on that one. How much are we spending on that? We can bring back the family case management program that helps families who are seeking asylum. It was a very effective program that worked. Um, and, and reunite these families. I mean, what, I, I remember the, the day I got to meet baby Fatima, the, the, the little baby from Iran who desperately needed heart surgery. And of course the administration said, no, she can't come to this country because she's from Iran. It was horrific. And we, we caused a fuss and got her here. She got her surgery at OHSU and her dad brought her into the office. And it was so meaningful, but it shouldn't take a congressional intervention to, to make sure these families stay together. So again, short-term things we can do with, with, with DREAM Act, um, but we absolutely need comprehensive immigration reform. Okay, Earl. In 1993, most House Democrats opposed NAFTA. The party's still pretty divided on trade, as we, we saw over the, the last several years. Uh, Democrats ha have since Democrats have been in the minority, there hasn't been much focus on whether Democrats agree with the president on trade policies. Um, it's going to be hard to avoid the question because, of course, we live in a very trade-dependent region. Um, how do you think this question is going to be answered? What's going to happen with trade? There's so much uncertainty out there right now with tariffs and retaliatory tariffs and people not knowing what, what's happening. What's your prediction? Well, the answer is not to pick a trade war with two of our closest allies and our largest trade partners, Mexico and Canada. Insane. It's not to slap retaliatory tariffs based on national security provisions that have raised the cost of manufacturing here in Oregon. It's not to inject more uncertainty. Now, the irony is that we're actually making some progress on the rewrite of NAFTA, which I think everybody agrees was important. I wasn't in Congress when NAFTA was passed, uh, but it was clear soon after I got there that there were changes that needed to be made. There were not adequate labor and environmental protections. Now, the irony is that we got all sort of spun up in the last three or four years, and uh, I think, frankly, some some very important work got obscured. The work that was done under the Trans-Pacific Partnership on rewriting the chapter that dealt with Mexico and Canada um, looks a lot like what Trump is claiming credit for now. But what Trump has done with sort of these reckless actions, reckless rhetoric, and punishing Americans forcing, trying to hand out billions of dollars to American farmers who would rather sell their product than get temporary government aid and lose markets overseas. People are understanding that we have integrated supply chains. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to people like with the United Auto Workers, um, they're concerned about that supply chain being disrupted and if it's not done properly, even though uh, Trump is touting it, it could end up losing American jobs. I think what Trump has done is bring together Democrats to have some very interesting conversations with our partners in organized labor, in the environmental movement, and business, where I think there'll be a foundation that we can go forward more thoughtfully and productively. One of the things I found, despite some of the controversies, when I met with people and we dealt with specifics, 
we found that there was a lot of common ground in terms of being able to have those increased standards. I think we can build on that, and Trump has given people an opportunity to understand ways to do it better. Thanks, Earl. I just want to add to that, I represent Yamhill County, in addition to part of Multnomah County, and in, in addition to wine, there's also a lot of hazelnuts down there, and they're now hit with a 65% tariff. These are family farms down there, so we need to fix this. And we need to answer some questions. Thank you. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Colin Jones, president of City Club. We've been listening to a conversation between U.S. Representatives Suzanne Bonamici and Earl Blumenauer, and we're going to turn now to the audience for questions. I'll be your moderator for the Q&A portion of today's program. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written a question on an index card, now would be a good time to hold it high for City Club staff to collect. You may also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. To City Club members who would like to ask a question at the microphone, where is the microphone? right here. Uh, please identify yourself as a member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. Um, I will add that I am a big fan of dialogue, not monologues, and would encourage you <laughs> to perhaps in your first or second sentence uh, include a question. And um, so we will start there. This is on. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony Petchel, City Club member. Thank you both for your service uh, to uh, Oregon and to our country. I work for an affordable housing organization, Reach Community Development, and the, one of the largest drivers that we see and we know exists in the need for affordable housing is income inequality. You already addressed Social Security. Could you uh, talk to uh, possibly raising the minimum wage and other things that uh, you could address uh, income on inequality through? You want to start? Well, first of all, we ought not to erode the basic protections we have now. The anti-union bias of this administration uh, undercuts some of the basic protections that people have. Uh, absolutely, there should be an increase in the national minimum wage. It's been frozen since back more than eight years ago when we were in charge, and they've refused to adjust it. There's also things that need to be done that are worker protections. The Obama administration established uh, new thresholds that, uh, uh, for the classification of whether or not somebody's managerial, uh, that fell under provisions that dealt uh, with uh, uh, paying things like uh, overtime. Uh, and the Trump administration rescinded it. But first and foremost, it deals with value added. We ought to uh, work very hard on that infrastructure agenda because that's the quickest way to create hundreds of thousands of family wage jobs in every community in this country with a wide range of skills that are available. Uh, it's, it's not rocket science. It's basics. Allow people to organize, do not undercut their protections, pay, the, have the federal government model that behavior and everybody get behind it. Anything yeah. to add to that? Well, well, I just wanted to add that, you know, the Education and Workforce Committee, when the Democrats are in the majority, is called the Education and Labor Committee. And Earl's right that there have been constant attacks. And, and we know the, the role of the labor movement in terms of building the middle class. And it's pretty obvious that wages have not kept up with costs. It's my understanding that in the Portland area, for a one-bedroom uh, apartment, somebody making minimum wage would have to work more than 80 hours a week to afford it. I mean, how, how is anyone going to be able to do that? So we need more help. I mean, I don't think anybody's at home at HUD right now. I don't think they're really doing what they need to be doing to make sure that we're getting the support, especially for, for low-income people. I also wanted to add real quickly, too, that the student loan debt crisis plays a role as well because there's so many people who are strapped with significant student loan debt um, that they find it hard to afford rent, um, daily costs of living. So in the education committee, we're committed to addressing that, both short-term for people with existing debt and long-term for making sure that everyone has access to debt-free higher education. Ted Kay, City Club member. This week's Time Magazine's cover story is on guns in America. It depicts 245 people involved in the debate, including, congratulations, Earl Blumenauer. Earl and 
Suzanne, what will Democrats do about guns if they take control of the House? Thank you so much for that question, because it's just been heartbreaking to watch what's happened across the country, including just um, last last week at the synagogue in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and there's a lot that we can do, and we can start with universal background checks. I mean, all Congress has done is thoughts and prayers, and thoughts and prayers, and thoughts and prayers. And so I'm, I'm a rule abider, I follow rules, but I broke the rule in the House when I sat on the floor, led by Congressman John Lewis and a civil rights icon when, a after yet another mass shooting, uh, Congress wasn't doing anything. So we can um, pass, at the starting with, at the very least, universal background checks. Uh, because that's something that most of the people in this country support, even gun owners support universal background checks. So addressing gun violence is something that I know is a, a priority, and there, there are several other things, but I think that that's a start, and a lot of the, the advocates who, who work on these issues say that is the best place to start. Um, and also, there is no reason why anyone needs to have an assault-style weapon. Uh, to, it, it's, it makes no sense for someone to be able to walk into a movie theater or a school. I mean, I've had students tell me that they walk into a classroom and the first thing they do is try to figure out where they can hide or how they can escape in our schools. It's unacceptable, we have to do more, and I know that Earl and I are committed to working as hard as we can on that. Ted, I appreciate you raising that. One of the things that's going to happen, I will tell you, is these people that I'm working with around the country are speaking out in their campaigns about gun safety. Some people are, are forming a campaign theme around it. I am proud that Democrats from coast to coast are willing to speak out and not be afraid of the NRA. These people are going to make a difference. Part of what's going to make a difference, though, is what we do at the state and local level. The ballot measure in the state of Washington. The notion that somehow we have to accept as inevitable gun violence is fatally flawed. We have seen states, and I'm proud we've done a little bit here in Oregon as well, states that have stepped up and increased their gun safety protection have less gun violence. It works. And I am hopeful that we will continue that two-pronged attack, having people of courage speak out in their campaigns and be held accountable and continuing our work at the state and local level because this is a public health crisis and it needs to be addressed like a public health crisis. There's no magic wand, but there are hundreds of solutions that have been tried that make a difference and we just need to continue with education, with enforcement, engineering, uh, and not quit until we win. And just in case Secretary DeVos is listening, arming teachers is not the answer. <laughs> Drilling specifically on this um, gun safety question, there's a strong debate on the left about whether or not to use uh, no-fly lists or terrorist watch lists as a reason to prohibit a gun purchase or a concealed carry permit. Um, there's one side that said this seems like an obvious group of people that shouldn't have access to guns, and another side that said, says these lists are racist and unaccountable. Do you believe that we should be using no-fly lists as a reason to preclude a gun purchase? It's well, we're all using, how, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just saying, it's all, it's all how, how it's crafted. If there's a, a, a right to challenge it that, that's actually an effective right, uh, yes, we should it would start with saying if someone is on the no-fly list, they shouldn't be able to purchase a gun, but they should be, have the right to challenge that and to prove that they should. Those are two it's separate issues. We have a flawed no-fly list, and we've tried to help people with this, and there are people that are unfairly targeted. We need to fix that. Right. But if we identify people who are legitimately too dangerous to fly, they shouldn't be having weapons. The same way it was outrageous that the administration decided that people who are not competent to manage their own finances and affairs should be able to purchase firearms. Thank I you. think that's wrong. Thank you. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, 
my question's about uh, a faraway place, Saudi Arabia. It looks like um, the autocracy there is embedded and will be there for a long time. Um, it has a tremendous influence in all parts of the Middle East, um, and I'm wondering what your take is on what we should do as a country to deal with Saudi Arabia. Um, well, first of all, we should not be lavishing, despite Donald Trump, every day Donald Trump talks about uh, the, rela the military relationship and the jobs that are associated with the billions of dollars of defense. I mean, he literally, in the course of rambling for two hours, the estimates spiral upwards. We should stop arming Saudi Arabia when they're participating in the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, in Yemen. It just ought to stop. We also, candidly, ought to stop hobnobbing with some of the worst people on the planet. Kim Jong-un, uh, let's, let's celebrate what's going on in Brazil and in the Philippines. Um, we ought to have some moral clarity about what we stand for uh, and I think it, could, it should start with Saudi Arabia. I know that's a, a very complex situation, but empowering uh, somebody, and we've had some demonstration about how ruthless they are, taking an American resident, uh, killing and dismembering him, and then having an excuse of the day, uh, that's not a stable partner, and that's a key to more instability in the Middle East. I just want to add that when Jamal Khashoggi was murdered, the president should have said, that's wrong, it's unacceptable, and we're going to do something about it. And his message was, was weak, and that's a problem. And I agree with Earl that it's a complex situation, but we're not getting the, the leadership and the values that we need, uh, which is connected, I think, with, to the assault on the press, but that's another topic. <laughs> Thank you for your question. What do you, we'll take one from the cards. What are you going to do about attempted removal of rights for trans people through the attempted change of Title IX reg regulations? Oh, thank you. We're, we're working on this right now and, and speaking out about it. I, w I was just in McMinnville a couple weeks ago, and an administrator from the M McMinnville School District came up to me and said, you know what our top issue is? And I think she's going to talk about funding or overcrowded classes. She said, it's the administration's policy on trans children. And what, she said, our kids don't know where they're supposed to go to the bathroom. And that's, and, and, that, and that's in McMinnville. And so when this is affecting students and people across the country, we need everybody to speak out and say, we value who you are, we accept, I mean, this is, this is the United States of America. Our values are for, for equality and respect for people regardless of who they are, who they love, how they identify. So continuing to speak out, but especially with uh, the, the policies that they're, they're trying to redefine gender. It's like, they don't get to do that. So we're fighting that. Um, and you know, taking you know, Oregon values there and making sure that, that everyone, this is already, as we know, an at-risk population, especially with trans youth, um, and sending that message that we don't accept them or they can't be who they are or that we're going to let the Trump administration decide where they go to the bathroom. It's completely unacceptable. So uh, we're going to be working on it both in the committee, and I know my office is doing things on a, uh, um, you know, sending letters and calling them out already, uh, even before we're, we're back there to work on the policies. It's, it's wrong, and it's discriminatory, and it has to stop. And this is one of the biggest differences you're going to have with Democrats in charge of the House of Representatives. We will be able to have committee meetings where we set the agenda. Trump makes an announcement about uh, transgender people serving in the military or trying to deal with the definition issue. We'll have a hearing. We'll be able to subpoena witnesses, make them testify under oath, be able to expose how shallow and flawed, and in some cases illegal, if not unconstitutional, their policies are. And that's going to be a big change. Thank you. We're good. Kathy Moyd, member of City Club. I want to first thank you both for your strong support of taking action on climate change and acid ocean acidification. Um, I was wondering, given the fact that the military has declared that climate change is a national security issue, 
is there any possibility of getting Republican support for taking part of the loaded defense budget and applying it to give DARPA money for doing research on renewables and allowing, you know, Eisenhower built the interstate highways Thank as a you. military. Can we get them yeah. to do infrastructure support? Yeah. Yeah, the, there, there was to, in to help with climate change. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. In in 2014, the Department of Defense made this finding that climate change is a, a national security issue. And so I know you mentioned ocean acidification. I have a bipartisan bill to uh, address ocean acidification. So that we can find on some of these issues the, the algal blooms issue, which is also really serious. Uh, I have a bipartisan bill on that as well. So we'll continue to try to find bipartisan support when, when the Democrat, if when the Democrats are in the majority in the House. Uh, I, I'm interested in making sure that bills actually pass both chambers and get get signed into law or become law. So we're still going to have to work to get uh, bipartisan support, but setting the agenda is really going to make a difference on issues like ocean acidification, uh, algal blooms. I, I'm convinced we will find that bipartisan support. It's really critical that we do. Um, so we'll take one more from the cards. How many of the solutions that you've been discussing can get through a Senate with Mitch McConnell still in charge? A number of them. Part of the problem is that we have not been able to use the power of the House to set the agenda, to build the record, and move things forward. We will have that. And there are people in the Senate who are not spun up on this. There are fewer of them than there used to be, and we're going to lose some more. But there are people who, and if we change the narrative, if we spotlight it, and if we take these incremental steps, like we were talking about in gun safety, like what will happen in some of the things Suzanne's talked about with climate, infrastructure, uh, there will be Republicans that will join us. I absolutely agree that many of these issues, and if you look at and what people are talking about across the country, it's not just here in Portland or on the, the left coast that people are talking, are talking about access to health care or prescription drug care costs or, or gun violence. Um, you know, some, some people are saying, you know, millennials don't vote. Um, have you seen the Parkland, Florida high school students and the work that they've been doing, raising awareness across the country? A lot of these issues are going to be supported by most of the, most of the constituency of a lot of these uh, uh, new members who are, are joining us. So I'm excited that we're going to get them through the House, but also be able to get bipartisan support in the Senate uh, infrastructure. Healthcare, you know, we, I, I, sometimes I look at it, and, and I've always been in the minority party in Congress. Um, I was always in the majority in, in Salem, so I've, I've been in both places, I tell you. Um, but if you look at it, is that everybody wants the same thing, they just have different ways to accomplish it and different ideas about the role of government in getting there. So everybody wants good schools, and everybody wants clean air and clean water, and good jobs, and a safe country. They just have different ideas about how we accomplish it. So you try to find where there's commonality, and then you work on that, and we're gonna be able to, to get a lot more ideas through that step of passing the House and building the partnerships in the Senate. So we'll continue to do that because, you know, messaging bills um, aren't going to help anybody. So we want to have policies get through and, and actually help the people we're honored to represent. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, hold on. Great. That's fine. Um, uh, we have a lot of cards. So uh, let's see. So we'll use this one because it's a follow-up. Um, how likely is it, do you think, that there will be a shutdown over the budget if the House is controlled by Democrats? and the Senate is controlled by Republicans. I'm really bad at predicting that. <laughs> because in 2013, I didn't think there'd be a shutdown, and there was one for 17 days. Earl, what do you think? <laughs> I'm so bad at predicting whether there'll be a shutdown. Um, you, I was wrong last time. You never lose a lot of money betting against irrationality in the part of the Tea Party <laughs> Caucus. But if we end up with significant gains and the Senate landscape in the next election is tilted more in favor of Democrats, and we're setting the stage for the 2020 election. 
And I think this is going to be a lesson to Donald Trump that doubling down, being more extreme, being more divisive, eh, is not exactly the best strategy going forward. Um, and I think there will be more Republicans who will acknowledge that. Um, I would think that the shutdown uh, would be a doomed strategy that would hurt them. So I would think it unlikely, but considering who we're working with, it's, it's not impossible. Nothing surprises me anymore. Um, this one says, when, underlined, Democrats are in the majority in the House, um, what gavel would you like to hold? What role would you like to have in the House? Um, and what will be your one top, because we only have a couple more minutes, number one legislative priority? Well, I mentioned that I've been working on this infrastructure finance mechanism in ways and means, uh, and that would be uh, a subcommittee that I would like to chair, and I think I could do some uh, interesting things with it. For me, the priorities, it's like, you know, picking your, you know, your favorite child, your favorite wine in Oregon, you know, you get in trouble doing that. But I have a set of ideas that we can move forward on that are ready to move. I have a, a range of things, for example, fixing the failed prohibition of cannabis. It's not the number one priority, but it's something we can move forward that would have significant benefits. The infrastructure piece. We have some bipartisan health care. We can do more than one thing at once, and I think everybody ought to have a short list of things that can be done in the first eight months that bring people together rather than divide them. Well, thank you, and I've been the ranking Democrat on the Environment Subcommittee and the Science Committee, and I'm committed to uh, continuing that work and expanding um, what we've been doing to address climate change. But I'm also um, committed to education, so I'm not going to limit mine to one either because <laughs> it's too hard to do that. Um, and because we got rid of No Child Left Behind um, and have the Every Student Succeeds Act, we really need to, to turn our focus to affordable higher education uh, and the education and workforce opportunities that are there. Um, I mentioned earlier so many students are strapped with so much student loan debt, and, and we need to make sure that there's a, a path for everyone who wants to go to college that they can, they're not um, forbidden from doing that or kept from doing that because of, of debt. So debt-free uh, higher education and the whole, the, 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 the role of education in providing a, a better future is something that I truly believe in. So um, I'm gonna keep working on that as well for, for the, the newest member of my Bonamici team, Mika, yeah. who's here, who's just a few months old. And we, we want a, a better future for the people we represent. And that means uh, great schools and great um, opportunities and a clean environment. Wonderful, thank you. Our time is unfortunately up and we need to pause the discussion for now. Before we close out, I want to remind everyone of the two exciting events coming up next week on Tuesday after making sure that you vote. Be sure to join us for an election night party and on Friday we'll have an election roundup with political strategists that have been leading campaigns around the state. We hope to see you all there. We are adjourned for the day, but please join me in thanking Steve Novick for producing today's program and our panelists for being here today. Thank you.